gibbons are highly intelligent, lightweight, agile, and acrobatic tree-dwelling apes found in the tropical forests of Asia. Compared to all the larger and better known great apes, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, gibbons are paragons of fidelity, living in stable monogamous family groups for more than 20 years within strictly defined territories more similar to human behavior than any other primate. Many gibbon species have become extinct already, and several others today are perilously close to total extinction as their habitat is callously logged, cleared, or burned in the fires that are fast changing a lush, forested realm into a barren area of weeds, grassland, monoculture oil palm plantations or rubber farms, which is spawned by corruption and profiteering that tramples over principles. Gibbons share over 98% of their genes with humans, and it is long overdue that we recognize our close kinship to these forgotten apes and become aware of their plight now before their long evolution is brought to an abrupt end by the ruthless acts of human beings. This is the story of those forgotten apes, the remarkable Gibbons. I think one of the main reasons that gibbons are the forgotten apes is the difficulty of filming them. I think there have, it, it, it is very hard to get these things tamed down. It took me a year to get my group fully tame, for example, and that's going out most days and trying to keep with them and having 30 hectares of pretty arduous forest um, hills and rivers and swamps to, to go through to keep up with them. Fifty years ago, it was even worse than today, the obsession with the great apes and the neglect of the small apes, mainly because they weren't so well known. The gibbons are the neglected apes, the forgotten apes, because they're small. Gibbons just add this crucial dimension to, to our relatives. And as I say, in some respects, uh, they seem more relevant to humans in their appearance and shape and social systems than the great apes. If you leave out the gibbons, you leave out marital fidelity, which is quite a, an important theme in, in human history and ethics. So you essentially can't tell the, the story of who we are as, as a species without looking across the entire range of apes. If you just look at the great apes, you miss out on an, an important part of the story, which is one of the reasons why I think the, the Gibbon story in particular, which has been neglected for so long, is something that needs to be told more uh, expressively and, and firmly. Unlike any of the great apes, all Gibbon species live in a mated pair with extreme marital fidelity. The males in a given territory vigorously exclude any other males from wandering into their territory, and females apparently do the same to other females with equal vigor and intensity. What makes them even more fascinating to study have been the recent observations and findings that given pairs of some species are not mated for life, but do occasionally split up and represent given divorce. The Gibbon family is a family as we know them, with mum, dad and the kids. The adult male, female, supposedly pair for life and produce young at two, three year intervals, depending on food availability. So in any given group, you should have a, an infant that's being nursed by the mother. And then there'll be a juvenile three-ish, three, four, that follows the father around. And then peripherally, there's the sub-adult, six, eight, who's years old, who's wanting to leave home, 
the older he gets. Perhaps the greatest trademark of all gibbon species is their loud and thunderous calls, where the adult males in some species give out long, trilling notes and melancholy songs, while the mated pairs of some other species will engage in complex and highly interactive duetting. There appears to be several various functions that these calls serve, from advertising the presence of an individual or group in a given territory, to reinforcing and enhancing the pair bond between the adult male and female. Gibbons are beautiful animals that live in the rainforest that have beautiful long calls and are a component of the ecosystem. It's not clear exactly why people haven't picked up on gibbons as being a beautiful animal with very, very beautiful songs and some of those songs, when you hear them in the forest, are the most beautiful songs you'll ever hear. At the climax of this song, she would leap through the canopy in an in almost manic way, leaping and whooping and changing her direction where she was singing to so that everyone would hear what was going on, saying, I'm here, the male is mine, don't even think about coming here if you're another lone female thinking that there may be a, a mate here, he's mine. And at that time, the young would also go through the treetops as well and would whoop. The male would sometimes join in just because there was so much passion and exuberance up there and, and, and would utter some noises as well. And that could go on for a good half hour, 45 minutes or so. It's one of the reasons I actually managed to get close to so many gibbons was that the subadult males will continue to sing. And then the subadult male will then sing for 20, 30 minutes afterwards. And he just does his very, very simple little repertoire. And Meanwhile, mum and dad will often go off and leave him, and he will sometimes trail behind and follow. But luckily, thanks to these subadult males singing after the group, it allows you actually to get close to these gibbons. Early in my career, one of my, I remember my, one of my most enjoyable moments was I went into, I was working with a, a person studying elephants, actually, and my job, I was, a seven, I was 18, I think, at the time, and my job was to to accompany this group of, of game rangers into the middle of the National Park in Peninsula Malaysia. All of this, any kind of activity in the forest like that, um, in the background in the morning there are always gibbons somewhere. They're amazing calls. Um, and it's not that they, unlike elephants, they're not really in your face. As, as the kind of front characters of a story, but they are providing the soundtrack of a rainforest. The long arms, permanently curved fingers, and light bones of gibbons make them excellent suspensory climbers who move around in trees by swinging with amazing agility using a hand-over-hand -hand motion as their setback thumbs form a nice, firm hook. Gibbons typically you will find in the middle and upper canopy where they feed, where they travel, where they in engage in displays with groups that are in neighbouring territories. They eat mainly fruit, uh, but not only fruit, they will eat sometimes the um, leaves, some young leaves, and they'll eat most of what they can find up there. They could eat young lizards, they could take eggs from a bird's nest. Uh, they could take termites from a termite stream and they will take or sort of investigate patches of moss and things like that and pick out little grubs, little bugs that are within that. Gibbons are meant to live in big trees. Gibbons like big trees. Some days they'll, 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 they'll feed on the first tree. Um, there's lots of like chaisi, which is very, very small ficus and they will actually feed solid for four hours while other days they will feed for 20 minutes and then move on. Figs are a staple in their diet because they're available year round. There are so many species, some fruit twice a year, some once a year, some every other year and so on. So there's figs available in most months of the year. So that is an important fallback for them. 
we can uh, suppose that they're actually key to the dispersal of fruit because they eat, most of the fruit they eat, they eat with the seed. They would carry the, the whole of the fruit with the seeds in their um, gut and then they would defecate over an area of about 35 hectares, about um, 80 acres, and they would disperse things through the forest. And when you're talking about trees that have really quite large seeds, the alternative is just for the seeds to drop directly below the tree. Each day is actually, there's a lot of variation. And then they will have siesta, which can start at 10.30, can start at 11.30, and they will be up there in the tops of the trees resting for two to three hours, during which time they groom and just rest and the youngsters play. The Gibbon family unit is close-knit, and both father and mother help nurture the young equally. For example, in this amazing footage, shot by nature cinematographer and member of the Wildlife Trust of Bangladesh, Inam ul Haq, in Bangladesh's Lawachara National Forest, this young juvenile of the Hulak gibbon species tried to swing from a branch to an adjacent tree, but stumbled and fell several feet. Then, note what happens next. The father Hulak gibbon grabs each tree branch with one arm, making a wide span turning his upper body into a bridge so that his son can regain confidence and walk across his father's shoulders to the adjacent tree. I came to this forest um, in first time in 1980. In Lawachara, in this forest, I could take walk on this, this walkway in 1980s and see several school of Huluk calling almost the whole day. I once even saw the Huluk, two groups of Huluk came together and they were threatening each other. Now it's not possible to see Huluk so easily because they are so few. This degradation or destruction of forest happened because mostly we as the people are unaware of the value of this forest. Nothing less than the survival of all life on Earth is at stake over the destruction of the world's tropical rainforests. Even though only 2% of the Earth's surface is covered with tropical forests, they contain over two-thirds of all plant and animal species, including the gibbons. Over the past 50 years, well over half of the world's tropical forests have been destroyed and are still being cut or burned at a rate of over a full football field every second. Scientists agree that within the next 20 years, if the rate of deforestation continues unabated, millions of plant and animal species will simply disappear. And that could include most, if not all, of the given species. The reason that gibbons are so vulnerable to extinction is because they live in these lowland forests. These are the forests with large trees worth a great deal of money. And if you lose those lowland forests, as, it, as, as is happening at a, a great pace in Southeast Asia, then you lose the gibbons. So their future depends on the wise management of these lowland forest areas. In Sumatra, most of the lowland forest, to the extent of about 90%, has been totally lost. And the gibbons and orangutans that lived in those lowland and hill forests, except for the national parks and a very small number of logging concessions, most of those are now gone. You go to the forest edge, you go to some of the places, and the forest clearance is just devastating. In recent years, in Indonesia, the pressures have got so much greater. The demand for palm oil uh, is insatiable. And the governments have been, the Indonesian government, has been using this as an excuse to cut down forest. 
and they cut down forests in places that are totally unsuitable for growing oil palm. But they've got the timber. They won't understand that the, their most valuable resource in the long term is sustainably managed rainforest. That will yield far more economically than any monoculture, any short term gain you get from cutting the forest down. In many parts of Southeast Asia, the, the natural forest, the good quality forest of the sort that, that the gibbons would like, is being lost at maybe 1.5 or 2% a year, which is very high. And what has been happening is that through corruption, through a lack of enforcement, and those two are very closely related, um, people will cut forest areas, sometimes unbeknownst to, the, to those in authority, sometimes with the full knowledge of those in authority. And they will then sell the timber to uh, sawmills or to pulp mills. What's very clear in places like Borneo is that there is a, a wave of destruction that appears to be happening in most areas. And the root problem for tropical forest countries is usually there is very weak law enforcement. So this wave of destruction which is the consequence of this wave of push for economic gain will result in all the forests outside of protected areas being destroyed. And unless the effort and especially the investment is put in to protect those areas, then much of Borneo and the lowland forests of Borneo and Sumatra will all be gone. Never before in the four billion year history of life on Earth has this planet witnessed such wholesale destruction of species and ecosystems? Well over 50 million acres of tropical forests are lost, forever lost, each year. These numbers, however, do little more than dull the senses. After all, governments are in the age of trillion dollar budgets and billion dollar business failures. The forests are no longer seen as a wonderful source of biodiversity as well as recognizing the gibbons and all other wildlife as national treasures and a national heritage. Instead, they are now seen as a cheap source of money and profits by government officials and corporations in the pursuit of producing oil from genetically cloned palm trees in places where lush, tropical forests once stood. Millions and millions of tons are produced now every year. It's, it's a very cheap oil and it's the cheapest oil in world trade actually and it's essentially flooding the world supermarkets if you look at the ingredients on almost any can of anything in a supermarket you'll find some reference to palm oil and we greatly fear that, that orangutans gibbons and others of our family will be following will be following into extinction as a result of this this trade and i feel that because it's actually impossible to imagine a Southeast Asian um, old palm plantation that is in any way rainforest friendly, the fact is that there's a, a very rapid expansion of, of palm oil throughout Borneo. Um, the world price is such that if people can get, can get re good reliable incomes from, from owning plantations of, of, of old palms. And um, because of the lack of uh, effective protection of, of uh, forest, especially in, in Indonesia now, there's a, a huge wholesale conversion of, of lowland forest into, into oil palm plantations. It's uncontrolled. And Borneo essentially is going up in smoke as this process of conversion to palm oil happens. The, the oil palm plantations, it's sick because they're not providing local work for local people. They're bringing in their own people from outside and the local people are worse off with their forests gone and with no jobs. Um, so that is really sad and really irresponsible. And I suppose it comes down to the government shouldn't be allowing so much activity from outside. Uh, they should be looking after their people better. 
it's quite extraordinary how much of the rainforest, and especially in Borneo, has been has been replaced by um, by palm oil. Uh, Eastern Sabah, for example, in in, in Malaysia, North Borneo, um, once was the most fabulously diverse forest in Borneo. Very good, very good soils, um, full of orangutans and, and rhinoceroses, and of course gibbons, uh, and many other hundreds of thousands of species. But if you go there now, 15 years or so since I first went there. You know, if you drive through eastern Sabah, you're driving essentially through one enormous palm oil plantation. Um, not just of one species either, but of one clone of one species. So there's absolutely no biodiversity at all um, to, to be seen. It's, it's, it's just one great clone of one species that's churning out essentially uh, oil for use in, in, in global trade. You look at our northeast and the southeast, you know, we, we really destroyed the, our uh, humid tropical forests only, you know, to plant this rubber, to plant these palm trees, but it didn't really help us anywhere. Even if we get some return uh, from there, from uh, palm, palm plantation or rubber plantation, the return doesn't go to the locals, you know, who really own the forest, who really, really live around the forest. You know, uh, it comes to, it goes to somewhere else, you know, uh, and uh, we buy something else out of that money, you know. So really it doesn't help our hulogs or it doesn't help uh, uh, the local people. In addition to the uncounted thousands of gibbons that are killed from the destruction of their habitat for the timber or to make way for tea, rubber, or oil palm plantations, Poverty-stricken indigenous people still hunt gibbons for food, and criminal poachers still hunt and collect gibbons for the pet trade. In a gruesome twist, gibbons are also killed and collected for their long forearms to sell on the black market as chopsticks for wealthy Chinese businessmen, as well as some Southeast Asian societies using their bones and meat as an aphrodisiac. Gibbons are delightful to those of us who know them well, in part because of their human characteristics. Um, they, they look adorable, they look like young kids, they've got sort of flat noses, wide uh, brown eyes, and they're very lovable animals. And people of whatever tradition and culture, I think, feel something difficult about killing something like that and then eating something that looks so very human. But those, those traditions and those constraints have disappeared in some groups over the years and people will now increasingly take gibbons. The park I worked in, Kat Tien National Park, is 150 kilometres north of Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. There's a big demand for, for gibbons and macaques for the pet trade, for gibbons and macaques for food, and also for medicinal purposes, for primate balm. Um, you, you, you get the gibbon or the macaque bones and you boil them down to a paste and you use this as a tonic. It's a tonic for, for men, it's a tonic for pregnant women. And this is still a huge business. And you can, even just before I started in the park, in one of the ranger stations to the north, they found this man who had a huge bag and it was just full of macaque and give them bones. In Kalimantan, there's maybe about 100,000 gibbons. Of that, there's maybe about 1% annually are being poached, according to figures from traffic. And the result of that is that there's a constant drain on the wild population of gibbons. The other thing is that they breed very slowly. I mean, as a paired unit, they can only produce two, three, four children in a lifetime, which means that they, their populations can't sustain very high levels of predation without declining very fast. Many times, illegal gibbon poachers would come across a mother gibbon holding her baby, then shoot the mother, hope that the baby survives the fall when dropped, then grabs and sells it to the pet trade on the black market. There is poaching going on, which often results in, in gibbons being 
being being shot, especially the mothers are shot to get at the infants. The infants are then sold as a commodity on the in in the wildlife market, and the the net uh, scale of that might be something like one thousand givens per year in Kalimantan and several hundred in Sumatra. In Indonesia alone, there is 3,000 gibbons that need to be confiscated from the general public to go into rescue centers. Eventually, gibbons that are brought into zoos could possibly be released back into the wild. But again, you need protected areas. You need to have mentally and physically healthy animals. You need to make sure they're going to have proper physical checkups, too. Gibbons can make good pets for a few months, but when they grow up, they become very bad pets. So typically at that stage, they will go to a rescue center. And a rescue center sounds great because they'll be looked after. And the idea would be that the gibbon will be put back into the forest. Such a grand, such, such a noble thing to do. But actually, it's probably a complete and utter waste of time. But, and worse than that, it's a waste of time that uses so much money that you're, it's an opportunity cost. You should be putting that money into things that address the root causes. I'm very disappointed in people who feel that trying to save species in captivity is useless. Take, for instance, the California condor. It had its purpose in the wild. It was down into the teens before they finally brought them into captivity and got the numbers up to over 200. This could happen with some of these given species if something's not done. There is a purpose for every species in the wild. The destruction of the habitat and poaching on site inside the national parks and protected areas must be stopped, but the byproduct of, of all that is that you have maybe 1,000 gibbons every year in Kalimantan, which is going through the wildlife trade. That you need, to, if they're captured and you, and the, the government authorities capture them and want to do something with them, unless they go back into zoos, then you need to do something with them. But at the same time, you can't put all your resources into that because every year you get more and more orangutans and gibbons coming into rehabilitation stations if you don't prevent the major problem of destruction of habitat and poaching. To comprehend humanity's unique position as it plummets down the abyss of extinctions and tropical forest destruction, it must be understood that almost everything used today had its origins in the tropical forests. As an example, over 65% of all prescription medicines available today are little more than refined, artificially synthesized tropical plant products. In addition, almost all the present-day domesticated foodstuffs, both plant crops and animal livestock, have originated and come from these tropical forests. So where will our future miracle medicines and life-sustaining foodstuffs come from if the tropical forests are all destroyed. Certainly not from the barren, Martian-like landscapes humanity is leaving behind in the pursuit of a short-term profit in tropical Asia. These governments that allow such destruction to continue are burning down humanity's future grocery stores and pharmacies. Like many developing countries, Bangladesh, has a big problem of having corrupt practices in the government and even outside the government. The corruption is rampant. And um, we have seen recently that the, even the head of the forest, like the conservator of, chief conservator of the forest, arrest, getting arrested for keeping a large amount of money at home. And so that's the top boss of the forestry department. So this is the picture that this lot of corrupt practices is in the society, in the government.
We thought with Indonesia when President Suharto left office that and the new government handed over control to the provinces that things would be better, that the local people would look after their forest. Not a bit of it. Their attitude was these top governor people, top army, military people. Suharto and his family got rich in the last 20 years, now it's our turn. And 80% of the timber leaving Indonesia a few years ago was illegal. They've got the laws, but they're not being enforced. And the forest is being wiped out and it's escalated by the El Nino effect, the droughts, the fires that are just making things horrific. The result of this burning is that the typical landscape you see when you drive around in Borneo is, as far as the eye can see, you see these dead tree stumps sticking up with no branches, just burnt, dead tree trunks just sticking up and grass around, and sometimes, as far as you can see, that's, that's what meets the eye. We have to ask ourselves that once you've changed landscapes quite so much, once you've burnt two-thirds of Borneo, the chances are that you're going to be affecting the rainfall, wind patterns, the general climate of the remaining. Uh, fires are going to be, become more of a threat it might be that the, the conversion of the whole of Southeast Asia to kind of fire-maintained grassland is, is, is the process that we're now seeing. In which case, all of the gibbons are scheduled essentially for extinction. Uh, our people don't know that they have hulaks in, the in their forests. So if hulogs go today, we lost tigers, if we lose tomorrow, if we lose uh, hulogs, uh, day after tomorrow we lose something else, and we'll be losing all our cultural and natural history. So without history, without natural history, without cultural history, what do we do with this territory? What do we with this uh, flag? And what do we do with this country? And how our generations could say that we had a heritage. Protecting areas is a real problem. National parks and other sorts of protected areas have been established years ago, uh, and a lot more more recently. But having enough people to patrol the areas, to protect them, is something there has not been enough investment in. And that's where the... Um, where investment is really needed in such conservation activities. And various projects have helped, but the illegal logging companies are eroding into the national park, still. And there's not enough manpower, there's not enough determination to stop it. And, and there were suspicions that the logging companies were making it worth the while and the forestry officials were turning a blind eye. And so, you know, what can you do if they're not being paid enough to do their job? They won't do it uh, properly. Although so many of the signs out there are really depressing, I can't let myself get too depressed and too despondent about it. And every time I go back to these countries, I suppose I'm horrified that the losses are still going on. But then I will meet another new local NGO, some new PhD student from a local university. I will meet people who are literally crying because of what's going on and they want, they, they want to do something and they believe that they can do something. And there are some very exciting initiatives going on. 
Many scientists agree that before the middle of this century, literally all the viable tropical forests will be gone and with them all the gibbon species, replaced by vast fields of dead weeds and empty windswept land. It will be a desolate, inhospitable, austere world of starving humans, fat cockroaches, rats, mosquitoes, maggots, and flies. At that point, there will be no turning back from this hellish abyss and the climatic upheavals that are sure to follow. Wild climatic fluctuations, massive flooding of low-lying regions, dry lands turning to deserts, and global crop failures will become commonplace events. Life, as humanity now knows it, in terms of moderation and climate, may well be over. But perhaps, just perhaps, if humanity could identify with and save some key viable species like the gibbons through saving their tropical forest habitats and ecosystems, then possibly humanity could be saved from the apocalyptic scenarios that we are otherwise relentlessly heading for. Throughout the region, be it in Cambodia, or in southern China, or in Indonesia, you have those in authority that couldn't care less. And yet there are, in each of those countries, some wonderful park directors, um, and forestry officials and local politicians who have really understood, who really have it, who care and are putting themselves on the line um, against those who act illegally. Indonesia has a fabulous protected area system which uh, is urgently needs to be protected. But, you know, it's, 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 ex it's an expensive and difficult thing to do. I've seen it done in certain areas. The, uh, there's ne one excellent national park in Palong, which ha well, they have a, a system of flying microlight airplanes over it. They have a little unit of park guards who know how to fly these things, and they use GPS units and radios to identify illegal loggers from the air, and then they call in their colleagues on the ground and they go and arrest them. And that combination of, of microlites and on-the-ground thing enforcement has actually stopped illegal logging entirely in the western half of the park. One of the most effective methods to stop poaching is to operate anti-poaching patrols which usually involve one member of the forestry department and three or four members of local communities. But those patrols need to be paid for. You need to pay for the, the maintenance, the field allowances of the staff. And for every 100,000 hectares, you need several teams of those people doing patrols. Then they need to have the communication instruments and they also need transportation. So it requires uh, financial investment to actually protect those animals in the long term. I actually found very, very strong relationship between the location of a ranger station and the gibbons. If there's a ranger station there, then gibbon density is high within five kilometres of that ranger station. Moving out from there, it then starts to drop. So it actually shows good forest protection does work. There's lots of NGOs. There's Monkey World, there's WWF. Um, they're involved in projects in training the rangers, training, them, training the rangers how to protect the forest training them how to do surveys, to actually create wildlife rangers who actually do surveys and monitor the populations of gibbons and of their elephants. There's different ideas for trust funds. Um, you can try to work towards a park being able to generate its own income uh, through ecotourism, for example, and using that income for protection. But there's pretty few examples good examples of that really working. And so we're still looking for the answer to how to conserve the gibbons. The Vietnamese government is actually at the moment very proactive towards conservation and is actually been very, very strong. And 
what the Vietnamese government say, they actually do. They are, they are, they are a very, very tough government. And I actually think they do have the power and the control and the willpower to say no to a lot of commercial ventures if they think they are going to be harming to Vietnam. There is opportunities here for achieving great conservation successes if we can, if we can mobilize uh, the international community to support the Indonesians, for example, in, in safeguarding their surviving parks. If we can support the campaigns that are underway to raise awareness of the value of, of, the, of all the apes and, and the rainforests in, in China and, and in the West. These factors, backed up by governments and the United Nations, we may be able to, and I hope and believe we will be able to achieve the preservation of, of most of Southeast Asia's, or much of Southeast Asia's current diversity, including all or most of the surviving gibbon species. That anyway is what I hope. With the work we're doing here at the Gibbon Conservation Center, we're hoping to be able to complement the work that's being done in the wild with what we're seeing close up. We've been seeing a lot of behaviors that have never been reported before, and it's great for us to have the opportunity to be able to see these firsthand and, and allow the researchers to understand what they could be looking for. everyone going to the zoo sees them and is thrilled by them, enthralled by their noisy songs, their graceful movements, acrobatic movements. Uh, I think the gibbons, the uprightness, walking bipedally, the expressive faces, uh, make them look just as human as maybe the orangutan. And therefore, I think the public love them. And there is enough publicity perhaps about uh, our relationship with Gibbons and monogamous territory, you know, it's a good model for understanding our own society. Eventually, Gibbons that are brought into zoos could possibly be released back into the wild. There is possible hope of releasing gibbons into the wild in either Bangladesh or northeast India, but again you need protected areas. So if you're going to be putting gibbons into other localities, you're going to need more rangers to protect those areas. You need to patrol them daily. You need to educate the people who live nearby. Give them incentives to leave the forest alone. So the, the projects that you need to get up and running need to cover the main, the main aspects of conservation work, which is community involvement, patrols, enforcement, awareness, rehabilitating land, regenerating corridors, re-establishing wildlife corridors, ensuring you have the proper legal system up and running, and a proper focused program like that requires funds to do that. So one of the main problems is that we know what to do, it's just there's not enough funds. And if you make a comparison between the conservation areas that are well protected and those that aren't, often it just comes down to funding. I'm feeling that, you know, this is high time, you know, though, uh, you know, the history says or, or our experience says, they will disappear someday, but then uh, the, the momentum we gained, or the momentum that has been gained by, uh, by the uh, organizations or, or the, by the work we have been doing, I have a feeling they have a future. If we have forests in the Northeast and we have forests in the Southeast, I have a good feeling that we could save our gibbons. And if we could film them now, and if we could tell other people this is what they need, and this is the problem, these are the prospects. I have a good feeling that 
our people will be willing to save our gibbons. We can't destroy all the wild places and become so-called developed because we miss the necessary part of uh, this earth that sustains life. We can't continue doing that. So I think we are becoming more aware and definitely while life and human beings can coexist and must coexist or we all probably will perish soon. The plight of endangered gibbons is symbolic of a much larger ecological question facing humanity. Whether or not those governments in charge of Asian tropical forests consider themselves stewards of the land with the responsibility to nurture and protect their natural resources, or are they choosing to continue their corrupted and destructive ways in the name of development, economic progress, and profit? I hope that this will excite people about the small apes, make them realize what a unique part of the environment they are, how interesting, how appealing, how they depend on the health of the tropical rainforest, and that people come out demonstrating, supporting movements to promote the sustainable management of rainforests and to stop illegal activity, to protect the parks that have been established. Tropical forests are unexplored frontiers, teeming with new animals and plant species not yet discovered, many that could potentially help humankind by providing scientists with the foundations to develop new crops and livestock or new life-saving medicines which could lead to a cure for the most serious diseases we face today like cancer or AIDS or Alzheimer's. Perhaps humankind may one day realize that the Earth is simply a great spaceship traveling through the cosmos and that all life on planet spaceship Earth is an intertwined web with all its strands dependent upon each other in order to hold itself together. Even more important is the realization that humanity did not weave this web of life but is merely a strand within it along with the gibbons and the millions of other species sharing breathing room on this splendid spaceship.